Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. We're going to be talking about something Catholics talk about all the time. Catholic guilt. That's right, we're going to look at the strange phenomenon known specifically to Catholics as Catholic guilt and what scrupulosity is and how we can overcome these feelings. You know, Catholics get a bad rap that we're always so filled with guilt. But not after we say mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. We're going to tell you why. back with you guys always guys yeah, and definitely like, a, a great topic yeah, yeah man because all of us have experienced it you uh -huh. know the guilt and shame that comes with sin uh -huh. and what christ does meeting the human heart that is suffering these realities and why we turn from a sense of you know my fault my fault my most grievous fault you know to a point of what christ accomplishes in the soul when we truly repent and reconcile with the father's love yeah so what is Catholic guilt? I mean, you, you, this saying's been around for years, right? Always. You know, I think particularly, you know, and all of us have Irish, you know, mm -hmm. ancestry, particularly with the Irish thing, you know, but Catholic guilt, I think, is a very unique phenomenon where we always feel maybe unworthy. Maybe we always feel like we're participating directly, hammering the nails into Jesus, and we're making Mary cry, and that the reason that the world's falling apart is because of our own sins, right? We're a failure. Yeah. Catholics have a very acute sense of sin. And I think that's because the church does a good job of catechizing on sin. But it's also a hard thing to balance, you know, um, without it turning into scrupulosity. Look, guilt is a good thing. Shame is a good thing. God put those emotions into us for a reason, but managing them and using them for to get us closer to God instead of to have us hide from God like Adam in the garden, that's the problem with overcoming Catholic guilt or scrupulosity. And, and the sense, too, is like it's such a misnomer. Like Catholic guilt can be just so misused and, and misnamed because it's like the, the church doesn't impose guilt on these mm -hmm. realities. Like, you know, the Catholic Church isn't identifying, okay, you should feel bad when you do X, Y, Z. <laughs> it's like, no, when you look interiorly into your life, when you do X, Y, Z or S, I, N, you are doing something that necessarily causes the reality mm -hmm. of guilt and shame, isolation, and you will know a tree by its fruit. Mm -hmm. So when you recognize these outshoots that are causing this dispositional uh, form of, of intellectual kind of uh, insanity of returning in that habitual form to these types of obsessive things, it, it draws us into a, a lifeless, it's drawing life from us. And, and as a form of that, guilt and shame is, is intimately a part of that. You know, in my experience with Catholic guilt, and, and I, I think everyone who probably will be able to relate to this, is that there's so many times where the world's like, hey, let's go do this thing and it's gonna be fun. You know, I don't know, you're 18. Let's let's go, let's go egg houses, let's go steal a car, let's go smoke weed, let's go party, let's have girlfriends, let's have sex before marriage, let's go to the strip club, let's do all these terrible things. And then you're like, wasn't such a good idea. That's no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's bad. Like, you know, you're like you think, okay, you're you're living in the moment and you're like, nah, you shouldn't do that. That's the kind of stuff that makes Mary cry. That's the kind of thing that hammers the nail into Jesus' hand. That kind of sense of responsibility. Now, the world looks at that and says, what's wrong with you, man? Just go and do these things. They're fun. They're good things for you. But this, there's this nagging sense of responsibility and participation in sin mm -hmm. that prevents Catholics from doing that, that I think that our society who celebrates those things derides. And, and you celebrate the pleasure. You yeah. celebrate the momentary rush. You celebrate the adrenaline rush. You celebrate all of these those things. Those things are all for sale. Yeah. And, but it's a, a great way to articulate this is like when you over imbibe and you're gluttonous and you take in too much alcohol and you wake up with a hangover, the penance is associated with the sin. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. already built in. It's yeah. built <laughs> into it, bro. Like, all we're trying to do is say, hey, let's be kind of interiorly disposed to recognize it and do something right. about it. Yeah. You, you feel this way for a reason. There's a reason, <laughs> dude. So what are some examples of maybe the – so actually, I want to do this. Let's look at the, what the catechism says, right, about yeah, yeah. moral conscience. Because guilt is a, is a component and a function 
of your moral interior life, your your conscience, right? Your well-formed conscience as Catholics. So this is so, from Catechism 1776. Deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Its voice, ever calling him to love and to do what is good and to avoid evil, sounds in his heart at the right moment, for man has in his heart a law inscribed by God. His conscience is man's most secret core and his sanctuary. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in his depth. Wow, that's, that's heavy. Excellent. That's Can we, heavy. Let's go back just a little bit, and I want to just bring this out again. His conscience, conscientia, the sense of uh, with, with knowledge. Mm -hmm. So mankind has this intellectual ability to come to know, and in the form of this conscience is man's most secret core. So the fact that we are aware and we come to know these realities in the secret interior space mm. of our core, in the sense of core meaning heart, at the depth of our consciousness is a very sanctuary that is proper to God and God alone. There he is alone with God, all one. I like when people break mm -hmm. open alone, all one with God whose voice echoes in his depths. And what is God's voice saying? Well, we have to exercise silence. In the context of our culture, it's so loud. And when we are living sinful lives of excess, we're constantly experiencing hangover and trying to have the hair of the dog that bit you to get over the hangover and oh. supplementing all of these pleasures of life. And we know where that gluttonous appetite leads to great, unhealthy, place in, in, in our physical, cyclical, mental, yeah. it's, and it is, it's absolutely cyclical and addictive. You know, being alone with God whose voice echoes in his depths, yeah, and it was a secret law written on, not by yourself, but by God. Yeah. I think that's why you feel shame interiorly, because you are alone with God. Look, there's no shortage of ways to lie to yourself that your behaviors are good, right? Okay. I can say, well, it's not that big of a deal to do this or that. But then when you are there alone with God... There's no covering. There's no fig leaf to cover up your nakedness. You are there exposed before God who is right and just mm -hmm. in all things and who wrote this law. So that's why you stand accused. You know, that's why you stand, you know, in shame because you know that you are falling short of this law when you're standing there with God. And I think that's where the core of guilt comes. And that's a good thing. It's mm -hmm. a great gift. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, I've shared that with a lot of people that. You know, I remember speaking at a men's conference and the guy came up and he's like, I was, you know, horrible father. My kids away from the faith. I was like, man, it's good that you, you're experiencing this regret, like because God's here to help you oh like, build you back up. Like if you didn't have this, mm -hmm. like think of where you would be. That would be a much darker place. A yeah. much darker place. Yeah. St. John Chrysostom, I, I love this reflection. He says, pay attention carefully. After the sin comes the shame. Courage follows repentance. Mm. Did you pay attention to what I said? Satan upsets the order. He gives the courage to sin <laughs> and the shame to repentance. Ooh. That phenomenal? Yeah. That's phenomenal. Like that shame is like that barrier for you yeah. to actually repent and to actually look, but hey, pay attention carefully. The inverse relationship. That's it. Is it that's exactly it. After the sin comes the shame. Courage follows repentance. Be courageous. Yeah. Move through the shame into repentance, and that's where you experience the healing embrace of Christ. Yeah, I mean, I think guilt, guilt is a blessing because it, it shows you that you know the difference between right and wrong. And when you feel that emotion, that is an invitation from the Holy Spirit to repentance, yeah. right? That's what, mm. that's what guilt is. Guilt is not a punishment for sin. Guilt is saying... I know that I did what's wrong. Now is the time to turn it around. Yeah. Now, avoiding that, that becomes sinful. Mm -hmm. But feeling the um, the pain of your own sin, that's a blessing. That's saying, hey, look, there's that's a symptom. That's like saying, you know, boy, I wish I would have been able to catch this before it got bad. I would have been able to cure it, right? Mm -hmm. That's a symptom. That's a fever. That's a headache, whatever. That's the doctor doing a, you know an x-ray and finding something before it gets out of control. That's what guilt is. That's why it's a good thing. And I think the best example of this is if you look at the apostles. 
you have St. Peter, and then you have Judas. Mm -hmm. Both of them denied Christ. Judas killed himself, right? Peter repented and became the first pope. Um, I mean, even <laughs> Peter even says, depart from me, man. I'm, uh, depart, me, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man, mm -hmm. right? That's the kind of shame. He was alone with his creator, mm -hmm. that same thing. And mm -hmm. he recognized his, his shamefulness, right? Mm -hmm. his, his urge to cover up his sinfulness. Mm -hmm. But he was doing it in deference to Jesus. Now, Judas, he realizes what he did, and he feels bad, tries to give the money back. They don't want the money. They keep your money. So he goes and hangs himself. That's the wrong side of guilt. He was given the opportunity to realize what he did was wrong and repent. He could have been St. Judas, just like Peter turned into St. Paul, mm. St. Peter, right? Well, everything was... But he didn't. He killed himself. Yeah, but Judas is, uh, uh, I guess in my opinion <clears throat> or reading scripture, his uh, perspective was centered around money. And so I think he thought that if I just gave this money back, this feeling of guilt would go away. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's a difference between a false repentance too, and that retribution isn't enough. Right. That's that's an entry. I've never really yeah. thought about that. Yeah. But you just opened my eyes to it. It's like retribution is not enough. It's an important factor. Mm -hmm. Sure. But but mercy. Yeah. You know, um, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss. Mm -hmm. You know, and we see that in the courage to sin in the example of of Judas, as John Chrysostom points out. But the shame to repentance prevented him to repent. Mm -hmm. Well, I also think guilt obviously is uh, it's a good thing, but it, it also lays claim to an area in your heart where the devil can use that and yeah. diminish any desire you have for repentance because mm -hmm. that's what St. Chrysostom was saying. is like he, he'll, he'll just tell you, look, man, you're just not worth, yeah. worth it, yeah. you know? So, so guilt, I mean, and, and, you know, I respond to guilt from sin quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do my best to go to confession. And it might take two or three days or whatever with my schedule. But I respond quickly because when I receive God's mercy, I, I experience uh, more um, faculties of my virtues and more joy and to see things clearer. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've got... A history with that, but but getting me into the church, man, I was like, there's no way God wants any part of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had no idea what was waiting for me with mercy. And I think that that awareness <sighs> and and that attitude of paying attention carefully to your own spiritual health and and what you are doing behaviorally to to recognize right. and do something about right. it is really important. Like, there's times where I'm I'm so attentive to you know, my disposition and what I'm doing that's that's wrong and that, that is sinful. And it's like, I'm calling up Father Tetlow. I'm like, hey, buddy, could, you know, I, I need to go to confession. He's like, Rich, you just went to confession like three days ago. I'm like, I, I understand, Father, but like, I, I gotta, like, I gotta go, man. Like, and, and he's just always so patient with yeah. me and so good. Like, he, he makes it work out. But like, yeah, it's, it's so important. And to realize what the sacrament of reconciliation is for. Yeah. You know, and, and how Christ has established and instituted this so that we can build up the courage to be able to repent. So where can Catholic guilt not properly oriented lead to? Mm -hmm. It could lead to scrupulosity. And I know a lot of people suffer from scrupulosity within the church, mm -hmm. where basically they're like, look, everything I'm doing is, is bringing down the judgment of God and I'm causing, you know, people are getting sick in my family because I'm sinning. And, uh, you know, everything I do, I'm just, even I, I have one fleeting thought and I'm going to hell, right? Well, it's like, and also with scrupulosity is like the, mm. the movement of contrition uh, moves from the heart and then, it, and then it moves to the mind and then it stays there. And, and so people are thinking through things and not, you know, not praying and moving from the heart. Yeah. So what is scrupulosity? Scrupulosity is kind of like an... A uh, an overemphasis and a almost obsessive um, attachment to fear of sinning. Mm -hmm. A lot of people experience that. Uh, do you do you ever get people with that? I mean, oh yeah, I mean all the time, especially um, in young people. Really, like young adults mm -hmm. who are who are striving after personal holiness and. You know, they've they've had this movement where, you know, they're super active um, or, you know, they have very strict parents. 
Um, and, you know, they've developed, a, you know, a extreme form of scrupulosity. And I feel, uh, you know, in, in the forms of empathy and, and compassion for people who do suffer scrupulosity, it's so painful. So yeah. for anybody out there that, that does suffer with scrupulosity and, and, and struggles with that on a daily basis, you know, my prayers for you. And, and I just want to offer you somebody that I've looked to who suffered scrupulosity and has been a wonderful help to those who have or are continuing to struggle with scrupulosity. That's that's St. Ignatius of Loyola. Mm. St. Ignatius of Loyola himself suffered scrupulosity in Manresa and, and when he was going through his exercises. What was that word? Uh, Manresa? Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's the area in which um, Ignatius did his exercise. Oh, that's, that's a city. Yeah, okay. it's just outside okay, gotcha. of um, uh, Montserrat. Uh, Spain. So in Spain, Spain, just outside of Barcelona, the beautiful, beautiful Barcelona? city of Barcelona. Barcelona. And I, a big shout yeah. out to our people in Spain, big shout out to Barcelona, a lot of love. Uh, to our origins from the Diocese of St. Augustine to you. It's all love. The continuation of the Camino is right here yeah. in La Florida. Um, but, you know, Ignatius gives, you know, six very pointed uh, tips. And, mm. and in those six pointed tips, you're going to find where your scrupulosity is being met. And he has a charism to serve in that in that space. So I, I, before we get into that, let's define what scrupulosity mm -hmm. is, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is from the Catholic Dictionary. So we've been using this word scrupulosity. Scrupulosity is the habit of imagining sin where none exists mm -hmm. or grave sin where the matter is venial. Okay, so, you know, I uh, what's, what's a good example of a, uh, a venial sin that everyone thinks, you know, with scrupulosity, I don't know, like, uh, <clears throat> I, boy, I don't know. Give me an example. Something that comes to mind is the devotional life. So, uh, mm. and I've seen this a number of times where somebody didn't pray uh, their their morning offering. Mm. Um, they they didn't finish the rosary at night. Um, you know, they fell asleep during their prayer, or uh, other occasions where you know this is clearly not a sin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or they're interiorly battling in the mind, in the battleground of the mind. Um, behaviors or thoughts that, uh, you know, would would be sin if they would manifest it and act on it, but they aren't acting on it. Or and, entertain it. Or entertain yeah. it, you know. But that the passing thought of it becomes an extreme form of grave sin. Mm -hmm. So could it be venial in nature? Absolutely it can be venial in nature. Mm -hmm. But they, they magnify that uh, to a point where it becomes so crippling and emotionally so despairing where in that form of despondency – they're looking at themselves as as this most wretched form of humanity, and uh, and just really yeah, and disconnected it, from God's grace. Scrupulosity is a religious form of obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good way. To uh, no, it. I mean even mm -hmm. even clinically, yeah. you know, yeah. like a psychologist will say that mm -hmm. that's the case, mm -hmm. and it can be a really dangerous thing because it 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 takes the true nature of our loving and very forgiving God, whose forgiveness is infinite. And you start to doubt that you can be forgiven. You start to doubt that you're good enough or that he's actually calling you or wants you. And that can be really damaging to a person's spiritual life, you know? And there's been a lot of saints who struggle with, with scrupulosity. And I can only imagine being a saint, you know, the kind of conversions that some of them had where it's all so new and they're diving into it so voraciously that scrupulosity, I think, is a natural outcome from that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe, uh, he was a, his scrupulosity was so bad that the superior in his religious order had a priest follow him around and uh, throughout this whole day and go everywhere he went. And anytime St. Maximilian had a thought where he was like condemning himself, his superior said, you have to tell this to the priest following you around. And then the priest would kind of guide him. So like he had to have basically training wheels to prevent him from having these scrupulous mm. thoughts. Mm. That's to it. illuminate its occurrence. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And uh, St. Alphonsus, uh, St. Alphonsus the Glory, doctor of the church, you know, a saint that we could all strive to be. Uh, he went, he was so scrupulous at times that 
he basically wore out his welcome from every confessor in Naples. They're like, dude, you got to stop coming here. You're coming here mm -hmm. every day. And he's going around to all these different confessors. Like, he's like, all right, I'm going to go to Father, you know, Piccolini this day. And then I'm going to go to Father, you know, Biagio the next day. And then I'm going to go to Father, you know, Della Croce this day, right? So do you see a pattern, like, with personality traits? Like, we mentioned OCD, obviously. Um, do you see a pattern in uh, their upbringing and and psych psychological, uh, yeah. I think there's a, a bigger element of that uh, in relationship to scrupulosity, but also it can come as a form of zeal for people too. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, when we when we look to these saints, you know, could there, you know, and I don't, I, I never did a psychological review of their, yeah, you know, yeah, their yeah. backgrounds or yeah. whatever, but uh, it can become a point of, of zeal, you know, where, they are so zealous that they're they're striving after personal holiness, and they're looking in that interior gaze way too far, mm -hmm. you know, and and that obsessive nature of of um, trying to find, you know, a point of speck of dust in the house becomes this obsessive nature of having a perfectly ordered, yeah. mm. you know, house and. And and you can see that too, like with people that I've I've visited, and it's like you walk into their home, and it's like a model home, and then you make a comment like, "Wow, you just what a beautiful house," and and you know this really uh, your design and everything, and it's like, "Oh no, you know it's kind of a little messy today." And yeah, it's sorry, like, it's a wreck. Yeah, today. it's right, you know. So it's like, no, mm -hmm. it's there could clean. be there can be you know yeah. some scrupulosity there. So. Um, it's like a striving for perfection and, and, and pride. You get caught up in all these different yeah. uh, sins. Do you know who does not have scrupulosity? Who that? Della Cross. That's, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, There's I no mean, duplicity like, I think it's, or scrupulosity. No, I think it's one of the, the you know, like, most he, inspiring part of his mm -hmm. spirituality. I mean. And he healed. He does heal he everything. He heals. He has the healing. You heal. But you're kind of openness to forgiveness. You know, <laughs> I think a lot of people who suffer from scrupulosity <laughs> don't have that same kind of Hey, I'm going to, you know, recognize my faults and accept um, accept forgiveness, but then other people will just, like, who are so accepting of forgiveness will go out and sin heartily. I don't think you do that either. Like, you're, you're not like, yeah, I sin big and get forgiveness big. You're just, you know, cool with that. That's a kind of a unique thing of your spirituality. You know, talk about, you know, accepting forgiveness because a lot of people can't do that. Yeah, well, it's like I said, it was like the heart, the... <clears throat> the big thing was overcoming my initial uh, ideas and concepts. I was away from the church for a long time, and then I'm like, oh, there's no way I could be going to church. And it's just a concept of God that you put in your head because you're just so sinful from being away from the church for so long that it's just a very simple thing to be distracted by. Um, an another thing about forgiveness, which I think really helped me a lot, was <clears throat> I was uh, mentored into finding out where my wounds were with my parents. And then um, then he said, now you need to pray uh, for 30 days for your mom and your dad. Pray pray for their prosperity, peace, happiness. And I'm like, I don't want to do all that. <laughs> and he says, it's going to help you to forgive them. And I was like, I just forgave them. I told you I'm forgiving them. And he's like, well... <laughs> If you I just told for, you. <laughs> if you pray for their peace, prosperity, and happiness, like you literally pray, pray for their well-being. Like if you can't do that, then you haven't forgave them. So I was like, why 30 days? So after, you know, 30 days, I saw my parents as God saw them, the wounds of my mother and having lost her father and then lost her second father, our stepdad, and then my father and his family and growing up. And so I realized that, like, they didn't harm me on purpose. They harmed me because they were doing the best they could, and they were wounded themselves. And so then I really sort of understood that forgiveness was not just something that God gave me. It's something that I could give others. And in the in the in um, our Father, it says, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And so I realized that if I can just forgive other people, that God would forgive me, mm -hmm. right? And so I am confident in that because I I remember praying for my parents and the release that I had of any anger for them um, and the joy of seeing them as being wounded and needing my prayers and mm -hmm. me praying for them. And so it, it was uh, something that I, I took to heart very early on 
and then uh, the rest of it is sort of history. Is I I I'm easily I'm, I forgive people pretty easily. I think. I mean, I don't really hold grudges or, you know, I, I'll I'll snap at my kids every now and then, but not you know I'm pretty easy going. So uh, I think I don't know. Yeah, no, that's I mean, it's I, I don't really think Jesus is easy going on me. I think he wants me to be holy. He wants to use me in the lives of others in my life, but. At the same time, I look at it like I'm in a battle. This isn't my bat. My battle is not trusting in in God's mercy. That's the battle. Trust in it, right? It's like the 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 image of um, the divine mercy. <clears throat> you have to trust in His mercy. So when I sin, I trust in His mercy. I trust that it's there for me. Just like every time I go to mass, I trust that He's going to show up on the altar and I'm going to receive Him and He's going to make an impact on my life. You know? Yeah, I think the word trust there really stood out for me, that trust is an antidote to scrupulosity. Because if you think you're always sinning and you're always going to end up doing something that takes you to hell, you don't trust in God's mercy. Mm -hmm. And if you can just kind of abandon yourself to that mercy, that trust, I think that's a that's a real antidote to it. Yeah, and look at how you treat children, too, if you're a parent. Like, you know, that's how God looks at you. Like, we're, we're, not, we're not that you know, bright. Like, I mean, we're, we're like sheep, right? Without a shepherd. Mm -hmm. So I look at my kids and they, you know, they've broken a lot of things. I don't have any nice things. I want them, but mm -hmm. I can't have them. <laughs> and every time I buy a nice thing, they break it. I'd be like, golly, dude, like what? But I, I still <laughs> love going upstairs with you one time and we're walking up and, and <laughs> yeah. you're like, See, I, I can't have anything nice around here. There's like a whole huge hole in the wall. And like, <laughs> yeah. All this stuff. yeah. But but the thing is, is like, did they intentionally break it to make me angry? Did they, like yeah. all these things. And it's like, when I said, did, did I just flip God off mm. and be like, yeah. no, I'm not going to. But this is, this is the you. point. This is another point. So like the aspect of trust is big, but also the sense of, you know, I've judged this wrongly. Yeah. It's misappropriated judgment, and it's yeah. and it's a big issue of judgment. How do you mean? So in the sense of like, I I am misjudging myself. I am misjudging these actions. I am actually playing the judge. Yes. And now as a ah. result of that, this is this is my scrupulous disposition. Yeah. So in that in that same sense, like you're looking it's at this. It's actually a sin of pride, right? Big time. It's a sin of pride yeah. where you think that you can earn God's love. And you're not earning it enough. Mm -hmm. And he's already mm -hmm. he, he's already given you his love. He's yeah. given you his life. So you don't earn anything. And and, and it's, it's not earned. It not ain't earned. It ain't earned. It ain't people, earned. It you ain't can't earned. make it earned. <laughs> 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 you know, but but it's it is like misappropriated judgment and realizing what the scriptures call us. It's like God is the one, as the scriptures, God is the one who executes justice. He is the one who executes judgment. We shouldn't be entering into these places of that as opposed to what you're describing is let's enter into trust. Mm -hmm. Let's enter into mercy. Let us forgive others, mm. you know, for when we forgive others, when we show mercy in that way, mercy will be shown to us. Yeah, I wonder I wonder what the capacity of mercy, because we have sort of like a spectrum here of get, receiving mercy from God and giving mercy to others. I wonder where they would fall on the spectrum of, giving mercy to others right mm -hmm. like is that is their judgment so i think it i think you can be so clouded that you are so self-obsessed yeah that you it's hard to recognize mm -hmm. yeah yeah because you're not even thinking about that. i mean if you're looking at yourself all the time how could you ever look at christ mm -hmm. right if you're always looking at your own sins and you're you're almost locking yourself in mm -hmm. you know it's uh it's like this kind of you know, like it's almost some... like this. Uh, what, what's the little dude from Lord of the Rings? Uh, Gollum. Gollum. You're almost Gollum. Just, you're staring at the ring yeah. of your own <laughs> sin, yeah. and you d you just become decrepit because you right. can't take your gaze off of this thing you're obsessed about. Yeah. And if you would just look away from that for a second and look at Christ, who wants to forgive you and has earned your forgiveness, right? Then it breaks the power of that, right? right? It, like even more so when when you were given last rites to my dad. Like I mean. If you're scrupulous, think about the mercy of God in that sacrament. Like if mm. you can sort of wrap your mind around a sacrament that literally wipes you of all of your sin, mm -hmm. you receive the Eucharist. Basically, he is by his own action through yeah. the sacrament. 
by his complete and utter gift of himself. Pure mercy. He is, he is taking you for himself. Amen. Right? At, you know, like there, I can't show anybody that kind of mercy. There's no way. It's, it's a game winning shot. There's nothing you could do. You yeah. know, he's taking it. Yeah. 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 Mm. And, and that's, you know, we've talked a lot on this shoot about the humanity and the divinity of Christ. Yeah. And, you know, this hypostatic union. And, and, Christ reveals the fullness of our humanity and the capacity of mercy. And when we think about to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, the perfection of God's love in the world that we can come to discern is Jesus's manifest mercy. So it's manifested for us to be perfected by it, but also to be perfectly merciful. And, you know, that, that disposition, you can't give what you don't have, when we begin to see the leverage of God's mercy in our sinfulness and in our sinful pride, really helping us grow in the way that we treat one another and the way that we treat our, our you know, our, those who have mistreated us. When we, you know, we look at our parents, we look at different experiences that we've experienced limitations or hurt or pain or trauma. In all of those respective occasions, it becomes an occasion of Christ's victory when his mercy is applied. And it unlocks the bondage of what we're held down by and, and the healing comes only through employing it because that's where we release. It's that release that you were describing before that you experienced in prayer with Christ in relationship to your parents. And mm -hmm. all of us have, have had that experience walking with Christ where we've experienced that freedom. I know that I have too. And that's where we enter more deeply into the love of the Father. We enter more deeply into the familial love of the Holy Family, and we become an intimate part of the House of Nazareth. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, St. Joseph takes on an earthly characteristic of fatherhood in our lives, and, and the Blessed Mother takes on a very nurturing maternal role in our spiritual life. And, and Jesus takes on this salvific role because he's the one who died so that we may enter into that familial gaze of the Father. So it's like these gifts are realized. So, you know, it, it, it's faith of the things that are and hope for the things that are invisible, but they are made visible in us so that it is being perfected and shown. Yeah. Do you ever experience, uh, I guess, people displaying scrupulosity in the confessional? I got to imagine that happens mm -hmm. a lot where you, you're having the same person in and they're confessing stuff. You're like, dude, you got to take a little easier on yourself. Is that something that you find is, is a frequent thing? Yeah, I mean, occasionally. I mean, I, I, I think earlier in my priesthood, I saw it a little bit more than than recently. But there are occasions where where people slip into those scrupulous practices. Um, but thank God, you know, like through people like Saint Ignatius, um, and really the litany of humility is mm, huge mm -hmm. in in that uh, process mm. of of healing and and leveraging out of that place and turning the gaze inward, you know, which is important. We need to be aware interiorly, but turning it toward Christ, mm -hmm. you know, in, in that form of adoration uh, can uh, really effectively work in the person's soul. Yeah. And, and another way that I think that you can look at scrupulosity as a form of OCD is a lot of the things that uh, can really kind of affect somebody, a Catholic who has scrupulosity issues is, is things like superstitions, right? Like, well, I, you know, I walked past the statue of Mary and I didn't kneel. I, I didn't, didn't touch go, her foot. I didn't touch her foot in this way. So, I mean, obviously I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy of any mercy. Like, oh, my, uh, you know, my brown scapular, I, I got it dirty or whatever. Or, oh, I dropped my rosary on the ground. That means I can't, that means I'm a bad, you know, child to marry. Uh, my crucifix broke. So that, oh, gosh, what does that mean? That means I'm going to hell, right? Those things can be really intrusive and powerful thoughts mm -hmm. in a lot of people's head, right? Oh, because yeah. they put so much faith and so much stock in in in, in following mm -hmm. Christ that they feel any offense is going to cut them off from mm -hmm. Christ, and they're focusing more again on the sin than on Christ. But those kinds of things are are a real, I guess, danger to a mm -hmm. scrupulous person. Oh yeah, you know? big time, big time. And and the danger is, you know, you can really get. Put into a situation where you suffer this for years. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I have seen that where people suffer from scrupulosity for years. And they suffer. Oh, big oh, time. It's a, yeah, it's got to be an awful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you got to be thinking about that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're really scrupulous. Um, so the Redemptorists, they have a ministry. They've been doing it for you know, sixty years now. It's called uh, Scrupulous Anonymous, right? And it's, and it's oh, wow. a ministry of the Redemptorists. Oh, cool. 
and That's it's cool. just all kinds of articles, resources, and different ways um, to, to deal with scrupulosity. They they will take your prayer requests. Good for them. They'll also uh, I think they'll even you know take some email questions and stuff like that and help you with resources for understanding and overcoming scrupulosity because. Mm. You know, Jesus understands you sin. Jesus doesn't want you to wallow in sin. Jesus wants to pull you out of that, right? Jesus isn't saying, oh, well, you didn't do everything exactly right. Well, hell for you, right? Um, I, and I think you can see a lot of this, you know, in, again, in ways that people are rejecting. Mm -hmm. You know, you almost get to the point where you're rejecting Jesus by trying to follow him so hard, mm -hmm. right? And that can be a that dangerous thing to people's faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the opportunity is always, yeah. you know, Christ's reception. Like he intends to not lose any one of us. Yeah, that's comforting. You know, the fact that uh. Jesus is saying that, like, smokes. And it's what you're saying too about that's describing your insane. dad's anointing. And I remember, like, I was like, what does this do? You know, I got because yeah. I was like living it. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then you told me, I was like, what? I didn't mm -hmm. make it that far in seminary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 the depth of of the sacramental life of the church is Christ's proceeding mercy to draw the sinner back. Always, always, yeah. always, always, and that experience of being a priest and being in those occasions with your dad, with so many people um, over the past ten years of my priesthood. And the beautiful occasions of experiencing firsthand, firsthand what Christ does for them. It's not what I'm doing. Yeah. It's what Christ is doing. And mm -hmm. witnessing the effect in the soul mm -hmm. of drawing people back. And, you know, being at the bedside of someone that is terminally ill and nearing death and receiving, uh, you know, these these this communication of, you, you know, you have days left and yeah. then they're reevaluating all of their life and they're recognizing oh, yeah. there's, there's nothing more beautiful, you know, Jeez. and, and so many people have, have been hurt throughout their life because of their sins and they're recognizing that and they're coming to manifest that at the end of their life. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, in the case of just, I don't know, you might want to cut this, but in the, in the case of, uh, of a sick person dying, at what point would you say I'm going to receive your confession versus like, okay, no, I'll just give you this. Sacrament. If a person is is breathing but they they are you know not able to speak or okay, so that's you know, when you would yeah you would do that with the family and with doctors you, yeah right? like and and you know a situation I mean sure, like yeah. you know you you come in and somebody is just like you know um, yeah and and. Or, or the urgency of this person's dying right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know they're they're receiving you know CPR, whatever it is. It's like I'm gonna go straight into the anointing right with without any form of uh, you know context or words or scripture readings or whatever. It's like mm -hmm. yeah. no, like through this holy anointing, may the Lord in His love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. You know, and and offer the sacrament because. That's what's called for at that moment. Yeah. So you have to you have to assess what is the pastoral scope of this person's need, yeah. mm -hmm. and what do they have the ability to do in relationship to the you know they might they may suffer from dementia, they may suffer from you know recollective ability, talk, they might not be able to talk, well, they may I, have I was memory issues. Like maybe a person who is on their deathbed, but it's really not into maybe confessing their sins. They've been away from the church for a long time, but yet they're Catholic, and so they're not. They're able to talk, but they don't give a confession. What I they... what I find, Deli, is like when you start listening to people, mm -hmm. they may have that disposition initially. Sure. But it's always that wall mm -hmm. of like insecurity. Like once you sit down and listen to them, they start opening up. Yeah. So you it's better to sit down in a pastoral situation. You may have somebody disposed where you walk mm -hmm. in and they're like, Father, this is my life. I'm telling you all this because I'm about to die. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But you also may have somebody that's guarded. Yeah. And and when someone's guarded, the best thing, in my opinion, in my experience, is you sit down with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You break down those barriers just by social conversation and then listening to whatever it is that they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. But as you're listening, they're going to continue to get more and more comfortable with you when you're only there to love them. And when they start recognizing that love, 
they're going to share more. And once they start sharing more, it will lead into yeah. a wow. form of that. So, you know, I, I, a lot of people have asked us to do this episode and talk about scrupulosity, Catholic yeah. guilt. And, you know, it's a thing that a lot of people suffer with. And I'll tell you this, though, it, it at least means that your orientation is towards the right, right? Mm -hmm. At least you're, you're trying to get better, even if you're either obsessing about it or having some defect in the way that you're accepting grace and, and forgiveness. Like I said, check out... Um, uh, Scrupulous, Scrupulous Anonymous from the Redemptorist. There's a lot of resources on there. Uh, and check out the six notes on scrupulosity from St. Ignatius yeah. of Loyola, too. Yeah. You know, very, very helpful. And the litany of humility. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to make sure before we leave, um, you know, because otherwise I'll feel very bad about it. And I might even border on scrupulosity if I don't mention Hollow. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Hollow is our sponsor. Uh, it's a, an amazing app. It's an app that I use literally every day. It's the number one Catholic prayer app in the world. Over a billion prayers have been prayed through this app. And let's face it. I mean, when we need to develop the interior life in a proper way, not obsessing over one's, you know, uh, yeah, like that, that scrupulosity, but to really develop the interior gaze in Christ, like having a resource like Hallow that has mm -hmm. the breadth and the library of the church and it's 2,000 plus years of of deposit of faith, they have, and it continues to expand like every single day, every single week and month, you know, they continue to provide new offerings that are going to help you grow in the spiritual life. Yeah. I mean, they've got guided prayers by people like Mark Wahlberg and, and Jim Caviezel, Father Mike Schmitz, uh, Bishop Andre Barron. Bocelli yeah. is now uh, That's so cool. a part of it. They got yeah. so many cool features, you know, sleep aids and prayer apps and meditation. They have, uh, you know, music and guided chants. Things for the and kids. And, and even, you know, like the fact that families can use this app yeah. too. And I'm seeing that in my parish as well as people are using this app as a family yeah. and they're growing in Lexio Divina. They're growing in the practice of yeah. uh, praying the rosary and, and they're utilizing it as a background to sometimes dealing with chaos in the car, but in their transit, they're using Hallow uh, to create that background and that, that support yep. to their family life. And just like everything, you get it free. Yep, absolutely free. So yeah. if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow, you can try it out for free. There's 10,000 prayers, meditations. There's all kinds of things. Scripture, they got a new Bible feature. You have a prayer group in there, right? Yeah. I talked Mama's to Mama's boys. And I talked to the people at Hollow. They said that if we wanted to, they now they will help us with the feature to where we can have our own Catholic talk show prayer group in That's there. That's cool, yeah. man. So yeah. we got to set that up, too. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a new parish feature in there mm. so that the parish can pray together through Hollow on That's there. That's awesome. So that's going to be coming out soon. they got a lot of really cool stuff coming out this summer. So go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow to try it out. Now, I also want to mention we are going on a pilgrimage um, to the Holy Land. So if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Holy Land, you can learn about this trip that we're taking to Jerusalem, Nazareth, Bethlehem, and so many other great places in January 2024. This is one of I'll the ancient pilgrimages, yeah. you know, like the ancient pilgrimages of Santiago de Compostela, which we've done, yep. you know, yeah. the ancient pilgrimage of Rome, which we were preparing to do for the Jubilee. But the next pilgrimage and how appropriate that we would go to the Holy Land, this is most impactful. And one yeah. of the scripture scholars that I had as a privilege uh, in Father Bill Burton, wonderful Franciscan friar and educator, you know, he described the Holy Land when I traveled and pilgrimaged with him as the fifth gospel. The oh, land, wow. the Terra Sancta, the Holy Land speaks to you. I mean, it proclaims, awesome. man. And it and I've it is there. so moving. If you have yet to go or you want to come back to the Holy Land, this is going to be an epic trip because we're not only going to be traveling with people from all over the country that are yeah. followers of our show, which always creates a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Parishioners from my parish and and beautiful it's priests. It's a cool mix, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, like it's 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 an amazing mix, and and the fellowship that's generated from it is very special. Yeah. But we're also going, and we're going to be interacting uh, with my bishop yeah. as well. He's simultaneously leading a pilgrimage uh, for the diocese, and this is his first pilgrimage as as the bishop of this diocese. And it's going to be neat because we're going to be able to come together for some significant celebrations and liturgies where we're gathered in these holy places and celebrating with the bishop, which would be so cool. Yeah, and this this pilgrimage will absolutely completely fill up. If you want to go to the Holy Land with us, and I think after we've done a few pilgrimages, I can confidently say we have a lot of fun. We pray hard and we play hard. It's all 
I don't think anyone else is going to put out a pilgrimage like us. So go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Holy Land to learn more and register because this will fill up. I mean, and we're going everywhere. It already everywhere. is filling up. Yeah. We're going to the Sea of Galilee. We're going to Nazareth. We're going to Magdala. Oh, yeah. We're going to Cana. We're going to the Church of the Transfiguration. We're going to the Jericho, the Dead Sea, uh, the Jordan River. We're going to Petra. We're going to the Church of the Nativity, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I mean, we are doing it all. So do not want to miss this. Yeah, mm-hmm. truly. It's, it's going to be great. And that extension is going to be yeah. awesome. The Dead Sea is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it's cool. absolutely fascinating place. And, uh, you know, the other thing that we want to express is our gratitude to our patrons. Yeah. You know, without your support and, and your financial contributions to our show, this wouldn't be here. So we thank you for being a part of our team a part of our leadership. And if you want to become a financial supporter of the show, go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. We've got some great gear and gratitude to give to our patrons. And we want you rocking our hoodies and drinking mm-hmm. coffee out of our coffee cups and slaying vampires with the vampire slaying. <laughs> we don't kid. offer that anymore. Oh, that was a one-time no, offer. Our but Patreon, one of my, my patrons favorite. took out all the vampires. There's none left. <laughs> 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 and then, you know, if you're watching this, click like, share, subscribe. We really we really uh, appreciate all your support. We appreciate everything you do as our, you know, as participants in our ministry. So Yeah. yeah and let's you. continue to pray for one another. You know, there's a lot of suffering in the mystical body of Christ. And scrupulosity is one of those areas of suffering. And for those of you who do suffer that, I hope that this show has offered you some insight and possibly some uh, potential leads to help Mm -hmm. you uh, battle back these interior movements. But as we look to the community that we are a part of in Christ here at the Catholic Talk Show, what a joy to have the fellowship that we do. We're ultimately grateful, and we'll see you next week.